Support provided by Walters Papillon Thomas Cullins, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years. Uh, hello, I'm Beth Courtney, president of LPB, and one of the exciting things we've been doing at PBS and LPB is the Great American Read. We are excited that four, four million people voted on their favorite book. We're excited that there was passion around reading. We were also thrilled uh, with the number one book choice and that Louisiana went with the rest of the country in, um, in that selection. And today I am so pleased to be able to introduce to you our moderator. I just met him, but I am bought his book already, his most recent book, <laughs> Fry Gayard, And he is a writer in residence at the University of South Alabama, uh, written more than 25 books. He's uh, a journalist, a fellow journalist from the Charlotte Observer early in his career. And uh, Fry um, said he probably was selected to moderate this panel because he wrote a book called uh, The Books That Matter. Books That Matter, Reader's Memoirs. Uh, reader's Memoirs. Kind of yeah. Life-shaping books. His own life-shaping books. So we're excited. I've heard some of the authors speak, and I can't wait to hear your takes on on what your favorite books are, how you liked the outcome of this or didn't like the outcome. <laughs> Any criticisms or praise uh, accepted? And thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks, Beth. I'm going to introduce the panelists here. It's a distinguished group. And uh, it's billed, I think, as a debate, uh, but it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> It's really more, we're just going to chat about it a little bit and then ask you to participate too. But, uh, you know, anything that celebrates reading like this is a lot of fun. And, and uh, as writers, uh, all of us can certainly appreciate that kind of discussion. So going down the table, I'll just go as they're seated here. To my immediate right is jo Joseph Crispino. Uh, he's the Jimmy Carter Professor of History at Emory University. Uh, among his literary prizes are the Lillian Smith Book Award, uh, named for a really outstanding Southern writer, one of the bravest Southern writers I think that we've ever uh, seen, and so it's always an honor to win an award named for her. Uh, Joe's current book uh, is Atticus Finch, The Biography, and it's, it's fascinating. I really recommend it uh, to you. Uh, let's see, next to him is Annie Boyd Rue, am I saying the last Anne name? Boyd Rue. Anne Boyd Rue. Why did I say Anne? <laughs> People do <laughs> <Sorry>. all the time. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's Annie Prue. That's what I oh, was. Oh, well, that's so good company. Maybe I, yeah. maybe I could, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> Anne Boyd Rue. Um, Anne teaches at the University of New Orleans. Um, her, she's written extensively about 19th century women writers. Um, her current book, most recent book, is Meg, Joe, Beth, Amy, The Story of Little Women and Why It Still Matters. Uh, obviously it matters to U.S. readers because it came in number eight on the list of the top 100 favorite books. Uh, Jamie Quattro, uh, who will soon be visiting the University of South Alabama where I teach, and we're looking forward to that. Um, her debut novel, Fire Sermon, is a New York Times editor's choice. Um, her story collection, I Want to Show You More, was a New York Times notable book. Uh, Jamie teaches at the Suwannee School of Letters, and uh, uh, Fire Sermon is a really outstanding book, so we're glad to have uh, Jamie here. Um, and then uh, David Jose Older is that? Daniel. Right? Dave? Daniel. Daniel. I can't read my own writing. <laughs> They're spelled the same. It's fine. Yeah, not really. No. It's just in my handwriting, it's sort of. <laughs> Daniel Jose Older is, the, uh, is a New York Times best-selling author. Some of us wish we were. Uh, his, uh, his book, Shadow Shaper, is a YA novel, which was the Times uh, selection as best book of the year. His latest book for middle graders is Dactyl Hill Squad. Is that right? That's right. Cool. Um, and David uh, nope, won the nope, International nope. Daniel, Latino, Daniel. 
Daniel. <laughs> Still Daniel. Man. <laughs> Sorry. It's been a long day. Daniel won the International Sorry. Latino hey. Book okay. Award. And, uh, um, and Daniel, my apologies for butchering your name. That's all right. You did it in a way that most people don't, actually. <laughs> Usually they get the accent wrong. So yeah. <laughs> you did well. You do well. Okay. Anyway, so a distinguished group to talk about the uh, topic of the Great American Read. And uh, I'm, just, I'm not going to be very intrusive in this. You guys uh, talk, but I'll ask a few questions for prompts if we need it. Um, but maybe the obvious place to start is what do we think of the winner? Um, it's, your, uh, it's your territory for yeah. one, Joe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you throw so I wrote, a bit and then... Uh, I wrote the book on Atticus Finch. I mean, I mean, you know. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. I wrote a book on Atticus Finch. Uh, it, it's a biography of a fictional character. How do you do that? Well, right. uh, you know, there's no right way to do it. That means there's no wrong way to do it either. That's the kind of principle that I went with. But I, uh, you know, I feel a bit like To Kill a Mockingbird, like Quentin Thompson felt about the South. You know, I don't hate To Kill a Mockingbird. I don't, I don't, I don't. Um, I'm very ambivalent about the book. That's what led me to write about To Kill a Mockingbird, mm. and um, the way it fits into our culture, the way it's uh, the w um, so many young people. It's the first quote unquote serious book that they're assigned in school. It's how they kind of learn about the history of racial injustice in the United States. And you know, there are so many uh, laudable things about the book. I love that it's taught because we want students who are in eighth or ninth grade in our multiracial democratic society, small d democratic society that we live in, to think about issues of tolerance and racial understanding and, uh, and those kinds of things that the novel celebrates. But there's also so many problems with the book and that, you know, the hero is the strong-jawed white guy, you know, and the African-American characters are uh, just kind of these passive <laughs> figures, right, that are uh, uh, acted upon. Um, It's also problematic because of the you know rampant use of the N word, and that's a difficult thing for middle school, eighth grade, ninth grade English teachers to deal with. You know, so it's interesting the degree to which the book continues to be controversial when it's taught today. You know, every year, I'm mean, just in the past two years, there have been times where various school districts have decided not to teach it or take it off a recommended reading list. And, all, and whenever that happens, there are always these outcries like, oh, how can you hate to kill a mockingbird? It's the most <laughs> terrible thing to kill a mockingbird. It's the most you know, innocent, lovable book there is out there. But it's complicated. It's yeah. complicated to teach that novel at that level. Uh, you know, I mean, the book has become a YA novel. Right. It was not received right. as a YA. I mean, that category didn't exist exactly when, when it was published in 1960. Oh, uh, but it's mm -hmm. become this book that we teach to children, and I wonder really if that's the way we should continue to mm -hmm. teach it. You know, and I think if if you read my book, you might suggest you might come to the conclusion that that's not the way we should teach it. That there's a lot there to talk about and to think about. So I, I, I love To Kill a Mockingbird. I hate To Kill a Mockingbird. I, um, but I think we all still have to wrestle with To Kill a Mockingbird. And, um, and uh, so I didn't mean for this to become a pitch for my book. But, uh, <laughs> Too late. Ending up, I'm ending up on that <laughs> note. But anyway, that's the way I think. That's what I think about the winner. I have a, a couple of thoughts. Um, not so much about To Kill a Mockingbird but about what's not there, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because the first uh, African-American writer on the list isn't, it, isn't until number 27, Alice Walker, uh, The Color Purple. And my personal favorite, um, where is it here? Their Eyes Were Watching God, mm -hmm. Zernial Hurst at number 51. Um, to me, these are books, and then Beloved's down here as well. But uh, these are books that should be read as ubiquitously as To Kill a Mockingbird is. And, right. and I think what the problem I have with the book isn't so much about the book itself, but the way, as a culture, we embrace it as a book about racism when there's so many really important books about racism that are from a more firsthand experience of it, right? right. Um, you know, I think it's really important for kids to learn about, and this is, you know, literature is the perfect vehicle for that. What does it, 
what does it feel like to be the direct recipient of racism, not to just observe it from afar as in To Kill a Mockingbird, right? And I think that is what really changes hearts and minds, and I know it has for me, it, it has for me as a reader, right? These are the books that have really mattered to me. Um, I, re I know I read To Kill a Mockingbird, but it didn't have that big of an impact on me the way, you know, Their Eyes Are Watching God or to The Color Purple. And, and actually, I was thinking about... <clears throat> what books really mattered to me and <clears throat> whether they were on this list and one of them is um, Maya Angelou's I Know Where the Cage Bird Sings that book hit me really hard when I read it in college really hard and it was so hard I've been afraid to read it again but I need to um, <clears throat> it's not on the list and, and but there's a reason why it's not on the list because it's a memoir and I realized that this great American read list is novels I think that's a really interesting choice, too, that maybe we could talk about, because um, there's so many great nonfiction books that aren't on this list that have had such a powerful impact on us. Why novels? And it's so funny, they called it the Great American Read, when really it's the Great American Novel. I think that's a term that we're really afraid of still. Hmm. And the book that is most often uh, referred to as the Great American Novel, Huck Finn, which has some similar problems, I think, to, to Kill a Mockingbird, um, isn't even on the list. Um, what is it? Tom Sawyer's on there, and they only did yeah. one one book per author, mm -hmm. which might explain that. Anyway, those are a couple of thoughts I have. But what do you all think about To Kill a Mockingbird? Right. Mm. Uh, I was just gonna. Uh, is James Baldwin? Did he make the list at all? Another yeah. country. Another country. Another country. He's on there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What number is that? He, he is, is the greatest now? American writer. So yeah, one okay. would hope, uh, right? <laughs> I was gonna say, like, where's James Baldwin? <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah, you're right. I was I was looking on here and I'm thinking Ralph Ellison, well, Invisible Man on here at 77. Yeah. I, I was thinking yeah. about Chebe, um, Chimua Invisible Chebe's. Invisible Man was 72 okay. on the main list. 72. Yeah. But I mean, these these are novels that sh surely To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, surely they're better than. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> say it. You can say it. <laughs> Go ahead. I understand why To Kill a Mockingbird won. I do. It's Someone it's. Mm -hmm. The oh, most yeah. ex yeah, kind of. I just gave them. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. It, as far as all the other, it's the book that the <coughs> most the Godfather democratically, the most people are going to have read on this simply because it's taught so widely in schools. So yeah. of course it's going to garner the most votes. I mean, I, mean, I think that's <coughs> this is just a simple matter of how these types of yeah. setups work. Um, it's certainly not this top five <coughs> list. Harry, I love Harry Potter, so I'm not going to say anything about Harry Potter. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I do think Harry Potter will enter the, the annals of like classics and will be studied 200 years from now. Um, Outlander? No. Pride and Prejudice? Okay, yay. Um, Lord of the Rings? Gone with the Wind? So I'm, so I'm a literary snob and I like literary books. So um, this sort of... But okay, so Little Women... I've, I've I've so we can talk about. Oh, here we go. I, it's, it's on. It's, it's, it's on. on. It's on. It's on. It's on. I'm, I'm so open. I love <laughs> Little Women, but I do think that what has happened to, to Kill a Mockingbird has also happened to Little Women. Oh, and, no, no, um, but go ahead. Well, <laughs> in that it is now because it is okay because it is morally <laughs> unchallenging because it's more has uh, full of moral <laughs> rectitude. <laughs> These girls are, okay, so my, my book I was going to argue for is as the most influential book was going to be Pilgrim's Progress as an act of subversion in the 1600s because he was in prison when he, it's a prison document. It's on Against the, the anti-establishment, yes, really yes, and the way it's influenced literature after it. Um, <coughs> but Little nice. Women could not, I mean, Little Women owes a great debt of a, a, a debt to, to Pilgrim's Progress. Mm -hmm. I mean, Joe and Megan, they're reading that and they're just striving to, to live like Pilgrim. But right. And one thing I discovered writing my book about Little Women is that so many women writers were deeply influenced by this book. Yes. And that was uh, a big surprise to me. Uh, so many women writers talked about Little Women as giving them the idea in the first place that they could even be writers when they grew up. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was so foundational a text. Um, <clears throat> but I think I, I have heard a lot of um, arguments about sort of the um, moral blandness, I guess, of Little Women. Mm -hmm. And I think it's much more complex than that. Um, because I think, uh, you know, Little Women is a book that was written by a woman who was incredibly progressive. And if you watch the films, you won't get that sense of how progressive the book was. Um, <clears throat> the most recent adaptation, also on PBS, Masterpiece, 
uh, was really phenomenal because it included some aspects that have never been put on film before. And one of those is the moment when uh, Marmy tells Joe, <clears throat> Joe's worried about her temper. And she's really scared that she might do something bad, really bad one day because she's let Amy fall through the ice because she was so mad at her for burning her manuscript, which I get, right? That was really bad. <laughs> yeah. But uh, she's telling Marmy, you don't understand. You don't know what it's like. And Marmy says, no, I do. I'm angry every day of my life. Wow. That is a shocking mm. thing for a woman to admit in, 18, in 1868 or 2018 even, right? Mm. It's a big, I mean, women's anger, I think, is only now really gaining, you know, this exposure in literature. Um, it's been, there's been such a terrible taboo against it. And that was in the book in 1868. And even though she goes on to say she's learned to control it, or she's learned to not show it, although she hasn't learned to control it, she still feels it. Um, that's the fact that it's even there in the book in the first place, I think was pretty amazing. So there are these moments, right? There's these really important moments. And then when Joe marries Professor Bear, which I know everybody hates, um, she tells Professor Bear, I'm going to share the living you know, you better get used to that or this marriage isn't even going to work out. Because I'm not going to, she basically saying I'm not going to be dependent on you, right? We are going to be partners in this marriage. That's a very progressive idea of marriage still, right? So I think there are, um, there are these important moments in the book that people tend to overlook. Um, and I think it's been such an Im influential and powerful book. The thing, the, the reason I reacted though when you said that, um, <laughs> <clears throat> the same thing has happened to it that's happened to Kill a Mockingbird. It is not on this list because it's taught in the schools, because it's not taught in the schools. I think it's really amazing that it's kind of stuck around as much as it has uh, without being taught in schools, and that was one of the huge surprises to me writing this book, was that I expected to find some teachers who were teaching it and go into the classrooms and, you know, find out what kids think about it today. Well, yeah. teachers told me, one of them said, she kind of summed it up for me, Little Women is a private book for girls, not suitable for the public classroom. And that killed me. Mm. So that became a, a chapter title and um, <laughs> sort of a whole sort of deep exploration of what that entails, what that, what that signifies, that a book about girls should be a private book, not a book that's part of public discourse. And it, I've discovered it is very much a book that gets handed from you know, generations, among the generations of women, and boys aren't reading it. Um, and I think that's an important, uh, it's kind of a problem, I think, that we have as a culture when um, books about girls can't be taught in schools. And I discovered, actually, in my research that the two books that are taught most uh, prevalently in schools that are about girls are To Kill a Mockingbird and The Diary of Anne Frank, which isn't on the list because it's not a novel. But these two books are generally taught not as a book about girls, that seems to be incidental, but a book about civil rights or a book about the Holocaust. Mm. Um, the one librarian, and then I'll stop. One librarian told me after reading my book that sh it made her realize that she was always encouraging kids to read across lines of race and class and culture, but she'd never thought about encouraging them to read across lines of gender. She'd never thought about giving a book to a boy that was about a girl. And that's so fundamentally important. That's what reading's for, right? right? That's mm -hmm. why we read. That's yeah. why To Kill a Mockingbird is on this list because it makes us, it makes us realize that there are other experiences out there, right? Other people. That's what that's what a Scout is discovering in that book, and that's why it's such a powerful reading experience. Mm. That's interesting because uh, um, Shadow Shaper is a book uh, with a female main character featured prominently on the cover, an Afro Latina girl, and I always do events around it, and and there's always a parent or a teacher who comes up to me and says. I'm so happy you wrote that book. I just, you know, because you write a book for boys. And I'll say, I did. It's Shadow Shaper. You know, like, that's <laughs> what, you know, because that is that, that thing that we have where we think there, first of all, we think that there's boys and girls and it's that simple. Yeah. Second of all, we think that there's yes. books for boys and girls and it's that simple and it's not that simple. Right. Um, but I really love the points you've all made and I want to respond to all of them, but obviously can't because then it'll just be a panel with me talking. Um, but yeah, exactly that about, to, to, to take it back to the first question, um, To Kill a Mockingbird, it's so hard to, judge, you know, uh, it's not just a book by its cover, right? It's a book by its place in society and what society has done with it. And I think it, it does speak volumes about where we're at that, that that's become the, the number one book. And what does that mean? Um, it's a book about processing state violence, right? And state sanctioned violence. And we're living in a time when I think that is the conversation that we need to be having. And the question then is how we have it. And, and it's exactly that, that there's, 
you know, there's there's so many books that speak to that exact topic from so many different angles. And when we rely on the one that has the white savior narrative over and over again as like, this is the method. It's exactly that we teach kids, you know, that this is how to deal with racism by kind of stepping in and being a savior. So white kids are getting that message and black kids or kids of color in general are getting the message that their role, um, and I'll say this as a young person who read it, our role, you know, in that equation is to be saved or be killed, right? And that's devastating ultimately um, for whatever power the book also has. You know, and that's not to say the book itself is trash or shouldn't be read or anything. It's that, you know, what does it say about us that that becomes that text, which is exactly what y'all are saying. It's interesting too that um, one of my favorite books on this list is Ghost by Jason Reynolds. Phenomenal and incredible book. And I'm kind of here as the token children's author, <laughs> and I was, to I was I told that. Ghost. <laughs> when they about ghosts. Oh, so Ghost is, a, ghost, and it's funny because um, Jason and I, he's, he writes contemporary um, narratives just about kids growing up, and I write magic and, you know, monsters and, and actual ghosts. Ghost doesn't have a ghost. It's about a kid nicknamed Ghost who's a track star and who lives in Brooklyn, and it's about his life, and it's about very everyday stuff that feels very big and very small at exactly the same time, which is literature's job, right? To make the small feel real and big in so many different ways. And he does it so beautifully and so poetically um, in a way that never hits you over the head, but actually just kind of seeps into your bloodstream, and you don't even realize the poetry is happening. And that's why Jason's so amazing as a writer. Um, but Jason also has a book called All American Boys that he wrote with a, a white guy named Brendan Kiley that's from the point of view of a black kid and a white kid who both intersect at a moment of state violence and one witnesses and the other is a victim of it and they both process it and they never even meet in the whole book but the white kid has to deal with what white privilege means in a very real way and the black kid has to do with what it means to be traumatized by the very forces that are supposed to protect you in very real ways and those two forms of processing trauma and then stepping up you know, in the face of trauma and, and, and dealing with it, you know, in the world and internally, to me, that's a narrative, you know, about state violence that is um, almost a counter narrative to what To Kill a Mockingbird is saying. And that's where I sort of want us to be moving, you know, as a country is like, how do we process this both internally and externally? And how do we heal rather than how do we just sort of save and, and, and push forward without that process? Um, so, so you think yeah. To Kill a Mockingbird is is not a book that helps us do that. Is that what you're I saying? think it, it could be, but I no, I don't think it is ultimately. And, and I think yeah, I think it could be if it's taught critically. And I don't think I don't trust that it's usually taught critically. The last thing, one, I'll, one thing I think. Okay, can yeah, I yeah. just say yeah, one yeah. thing real quick? If it's taught uh, in a historical context, yes. that helps. Because in 1930, in the 1930s, when that's when it's set, right. One of the things that was happening then was the trial of the Scottsboro Boys, and mm. and. Uh, and that was a, a classic case of states' violence and, and potent, the potential for, uh, you know, not only imprisoning, which they did, but possibly executing uh, nine obviously innocent, you know, African American kids. And right. Harper Lee undoubtedly knew about that trial right. when she was growing up. So if you, there are ways to teach it that set it in a context. Definitely. And even if the even if there's a paternalism about the book, um, for some of us, I read it in 1960, and I was what was I 13 when mm -hmm. I read it, and it was an act of subversion in my family to read *To Kill a Mockingbird*. Mm -hmm. sure. I believe that because sure. it was a deep South white Southern family with roots in Monroeville, where Harper Lee lived. Um, but then reading uh, James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time mm -hmm. two years later kind of completed, <laughs> you know, sort of completed. But I think the, the, the historical setting for books sometimes can be an important way to add to the Absolute. depth of understanding. Except for that, I just I, I agree with everything that you said. Oh, we agree. Yeah, it's yeah. a question of how, I think. The only one other point I just really quickly wanted to make was it, it's fascinating to me what the black and brown imagination is allowed to do in the scope of American books. I think there's only one book in here that's of literature of the imagination by a writer of color. And I think that's fascinating. Which I, one? Um, Beloved. Oh, right. Right? Okay. Yes, yes. Do we have another? Oh, Intuitionist I haven't read. Uh, there might be more. I, I just think that's an interesting place um, in terms of taking a, a look at like where we're at, right? This is a democratic process, right? That everyone voted, right? So there's also no native people on this list. That's an interesting place that we have to stop and say, you know, where are we at as a literary community that 
write, American readers don't read native authors mm -hmm. to the point that they ceremony show up on this would list. Be a really good yes, one. I haven't read it, but I've heard Leslie amazing Barman things about ceremony. Amazing yeah, book, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of great writers out there. Uh, ceremony, Asian, Asian American representation by Leslie Marmon. Is it? Yeah, I'm asking. Uh, Amy Tan. Amy Tan's on. Don't. Amy. I don't know if there's. So, more. so one Asian. Joy Luck Club. Wow. Has anyone read Ghosts Out of Watchmen? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I wanted to hear about that, too. I, I, I was it. curious yeah. if uh, what people thought about that. I haven't read it. I haven't it. read it either. Um, I, I, th it's, uh, I think whatever you think of it as a work of fiction, it's fascinating as a historical document right. okay. to give us insight into what Harper Lee was struggling to get down on the page the first time she sat down to write a serious piece of extended fiction. Mm -hmm. She'd only written stories up to that point. And the book, the politics of the book are much more on the surface, whereas the politics of, of, watch, of, of Mockingbird are more elusive. It's mm -hmm. set back in time, though it's written in the, in the 1950s. And um, it's not a good novel, but you know, <laughs> it's hard to write novels, and it's like it's her first effort, and she, it was never edited, oh, right, and right. you know, um, but it's a, it's fascinating uh, to give insight into what you then you know did in Mockingbird, mm. and it's important to know too you know that it came before To Kill a Mockingbird, mm. and that she always saw those characters as part of the same larger narrative arc. That's clear from some exclusive sources I had access to that come from Harper Collins' uh, internal archives. That mm. you know, it's not like she wrote a version of Atticus that was racist and misogynist and said, no, I don't like that, I'm going to make him an ideal figure. She always imagined that the same Attica, the Atticus of Mockingbird was the Atticus of Watchmen, seen from different perspectives at different times in that character's life. Don't you kind of wish that, that, that we had had some of that perspective in, I feel like that would have made To Kill a Mockingbird a much more useful read oh, in yeah, terms yeah, of yeah. like... Well, you know, they're, you know, Aaron yeah. Sorkin's adapting it. Yeah, and it sounds like he's oh, really? going to yeah. do it really interestingly, right? Yeah, I... I uh, yeah. I'm excited about that. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I wanted to say shout out to um, The Count of Monte Cristo. Yeah. Because that is, it's not a, a fantastical book, but it is a, a very much a genre book that um, now is a classic and, and literary, but it's an adventure story, and it's an amazing adventure story by a black writer who knew who he was and how he walked through the world and what he carried and how complex that was. And I was, whenever I read it, it I think of that. Uh, even though the character isn't, isn't portrayed as of color at all, um, I think it is a story about coming into a world that doesn't accept you and like figuring it out better than it knows itself and sort of winning against all odds. And it, it's just an amazing book that I love. Can I ask why, can I ask how these books gone that, how did Fifty Shades of Grey and the Left Behind series get on. Well, it's I'm voted. Just curious. People voted for them. Well, according yeah, yeah. to the, the website, nomination, right. how does it work? This they did a survey. Theory. They did a, a, a demographically, right. you know, statistical survey okay. of about 7,000 people. Yeah. And uh, based on that, they came up with a list of 100, taking out, you know, duplicates for the same author. So I guess, gotcha. whoever, yeah, mm. that sort of thing. But yeah, it is, that's a curious question, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's one of the most popular books of all time, but then, so but that's how it got on there. Right? Like the vote, like, so? Fifty Shades. Yeah. Is it? It's so huge. The so the rankings yes. represent the way America votes. Right. Oh, once right. they had the once list of a hundred. Once they had the list of one hundred. Right. right. Uh, so when those we first were given, you can imagine how on television, all the general managers, we were given this list, and everybody would hear the little. <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, it was like, and, and you were like, oh no, what is America going to do? And I, of course, was thinking, what Louisiana offers? Promise. <laughs> when I didn't see Ernest Gaines, when I didn't oh, see Walker Percy, right. when I didn't see um, Robert, Pim Robert Pim Warren, all the King's Men, I was like, Truman Capote? Truman Capote's not on here either. You know, but I went back and looked at all that and thought, well, so interesting. All the King's Men is not on this list. Yeah. I'm sorry, I haven't looked at it closely. That's a, <laughs> that's a shocker, for sure. <laughs> and and also Ernest J. Gaines, what did you say? A lesson before dying. Well, that's I, I know, a lesson right. before dying. Sure. Hmm. So Right. So I was curious as to how the list So, so the interesting happen. thing, I think, is just pardon me for busting in, but, but all, what we all did then was to go out and say all of the stations around, well, who are our favorite sons? And so I'm having a war with the head of Kentucky who wants Robert Ben Warren, and I was saying, no, I have Robert <laughs> no. And so we've been doing outreach sort of things around this. So the whole idea then was to get people excited about reading and passionate about what's your favorite? Well, why do you think that one is? Mm -hmm. And I had some people who were just so Harry Potter fanatics, like every day, every child was voting in the entire. So I, I, I thought Harry Potter. I actually thought Harry Potter was going to win. 
I mean, you know, let's do think about this historically. This is why they started ranking uh, college football teams in the first place, right? So that to draw interest right. and yeah. enthusiasm, right. you know. Right. right. That's right. I mean, that's the. I mean, it is absurd. The whole the whole process is absurd. <laughs> but it's you know, but it's but fun. Still fun. Yeah. I don't even uh, know what the, that book it's is. A it's a strange. It's a Doña Barbara. Yeah. I have no idea. I don't know. Ninety nine is intuitionist. Somebody mentioned that. Yeah, Ghost is 97. I, I haven't heard of the last four. White Six. Teeth is 90, uh, 96, Zadie well, Smith. Wow. That's interesting. Well, the other thing to, I think, keep in mind about the voting is that um, people were allowed to vote every day if they wanted to multiple, the, uh, multiple times. You could only vote uh, once per day, uh, but you could vote every day. <laughs> And that's how probably that's Outlander got on there. I heard that the um, the author had a coordinated campaign, campaign oh. with her fans, and she's a lot of fans. And it's on, yeah. you know, it's on TV. I wonder too how much influence adaptations have. That's what I was thinking about the the Godfather. Yeah. 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 I think I think added. Well, that's interesting Everyone because To films, Kill a yeah. Mockingbird right. has that one film. Mm -hmm. Right, that's right. just it's just stuck there for all time. Whereas Little Women has been filmed multiple times and is being filmed again. It was just a PBS masterpiece. Mm -hmm. There were three previous films, and now Greta Gerwig is making an adaptation, and it's the same producers who made the 1994 film. And I think the understanding is that there has to be a new adaptation for a new generation, that because girls aren't reading Little Women like they used to. Um, you know, when I've been all the talks that I've been doing, it's mostly older women and a couple of husbands who are tagging along. Um, but it's, it's almost no younger women at all, which has been sad to see. But I'm, I'm glad it's still showing up on the list, but it, the, 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 I think the books on the list are the ones that people were fanatic about, right? Mm. Enough to go on and you know, click every day. Right. Yeah, Isn't so I've voted many times for little women, <laughs> I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> oh. yes. Isn't it interesting that the, the Sirens of Titan is the Kurt Vonnegut title and not Slaughterhouse Five? Yeah. I find that I so that's weird. Yeah, that's I, and I used to be a, when I was a teenager, I was a huge Kurt Vonnegut fan, and I don't think I ever read Sirens of Titan. That's fascinating. Oh. Yeah. What'd you think of Slaughterhouse Five? I liked it, but I honestly like uh, Breakfast of Champions much better, okay. uh, personally. But this is quite an interesting list. How does that happen? <laughs> anyway. Jurassic Park. I was going to guess like 80%, 80 to 85% women. Is, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I guess that is like, I know that my publishers are always telling me what my stati what statistics are on people who buy books. Yeah. And it's like 85% women, mm -hmm. especially novels. Mm -hmm. Well, that is interesting. Right, yes, it's, novel. it's really interesting how many, you know, coming of age stories of young women are on this, on this mm -hmm. list, considering that they're not taught in the schools, right? The, there's uh, Little Women's number eight, Jane Eyre's number 10, Anne of Green Gables is number 11, mm. A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, 13. Um, and To Kill a Mockingbird, number one. Well, To Kill a Mockingbird, number one. <laughs> By the way. Sorry, you know. True. And uh, there was, oh, Rebecca's number 25. The Stand. The stand. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Stephen King, right? Not a coming of age stuff. For like, but then yeah, coming of age stuff. where she the red curtain kind of grows. I mean, those are some. Those Why are like, do the dogs always all, die? But all of those coming of age stories of girls, they're all descended from Little Women, right? Wait, little Women was kind of the first. Where the red curtain grows is about a boy, right? Oh, yeah. you're right. You're right. right. I'm getting yes. that confused okay. with the yeah. There's another book with the similar. With, where dogs die at the end. Probably. There's so many kids' books where they no, kill the dogs. I think it's. I think <laughs> those are boy books. The ones oh, the, dogs. yeah, the boys yeah. and their dogs. That's true. Sorry, there's another book. Because boys can handle thing. animal deaths, but girls can't. Not this uh, boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Probably, although um, I think there was there were a lot of partnerships with libraries. And you can see uh, our library here, East Baton Rouge Parish Library, they, they, you know, out there, they they were very active in doing this. So it's a reflection mm -hmm. of people who go to their local hmm. libraries and things, I think, too. Those were our biggest partners. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. I do think the literary versus genre conversation is kind of alive on this list. If you looked at the top ten, it was literally five fantasy books and five real, realist, real world books. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
which I thought was pretty fascinating. Oh, um, I forgot Pride and Prejudice number four, another. Mm -hmm, another. Mm -hmm. yeah, How another you couldn't gone with the wind between that distinction. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is a fantasy. That that is absolutely cool. yeah. Okay, six to four, six to I'm four. I'm surprised you're right. that one is still so high. Yeah. Oh, so America. As a diehard Flannery O'Connor fan, I would love to see a short oh. story is kind of open, open this contest to, to short stories because it, it does seem a crying yeah. shame to me that she's not in contention. Well, and I poetry, too. I'd so love to see. So what would you think about us doing another series? Yes. And we could do it on, on um, nonfiction. Nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Of, you know, mm -hmm. short yeah. stories. Yes. Or something that more expansive. I, I see that in our future. I love that. I was going to ask Good. that question. Yeah. Yeah. I think nonfiction is a genre gets overlooked too, too often. Yeah, that'd be yeah. great. Oh, I bet you're right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, everybody's like, no, I'm pretty sure I'd be reading that. Um, no, you shouldn't. <laughs> have you read it? Is it? Wait, have you read I it? I have read it. Oh, <laughs> I have read it. I really think that's what the push was, is because I think the average number of books that Americans read now is under a dozen. I feel like people are reading more and more. I, we keep going through these different well, levels no, of. That's yeah. because yeah. you go to work book festivals. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Well, how many? So it's out, right? That's true. Well, it had it true. has gotten us excited about reading, and I think they should continue and do some mm -hmm. other genres too. But let's. Let, how many of you read Outlander? Crickets. That's as much as I could stomach too, because it's it's a romance, right? It's fantasy romance that uh, features rape. Okay, oh. the main yeah, the main uh, hero rapes the heroine what yeah and i'm supposed to you know no i, I that's that's when i was done and so th that's why i'm really disappointed that it's at number two that we can just overlook something like that um as a I culture and still get you know all mm. excited up i i just really don't understand it mm. well i told you my uh, as i went to analyze all the various states because I, I too was trying to figure out why yeah. I know it's, it's a popular series, but not that many people watch stars. Or, <laughs> I mean, you know, and so consequently, I was looking at it, and I, I realized that all of Canada voted for Outlander. And all of it's our... It's Canadians. No, no. All, they all did. Yeah, yeah they all yeah. did. Right. It was number one. And so it, that combined with their... Well, it's, it's, not, just, it's not just a random rape that her husband has raped her to put her in her place and show her how to be a submissive wife because she's, you know, she's from the she's from the 20th century and she's gone back in time to the, what, 17th, 18th century and she doesn't know how to be a woman in that time, right? She's a little too independent. That's what it's about. So That's but what you're that saying it's not treated with nuance. It's not showing, like, no. look how bad this is. You're saying this is just put out there and then No, not. and we're still supposed to be all gaga over Jamie after he does that to her. I see. So you're no, not saying it's a, it's that anyway. No, it's a very it's a very problematic book. Okay. I mean, you know, as is To Kill a Mockingbird, mm -hmm. um, but on a level that is is deeply troubling, I think, and is is very very problematic. I mean, it, one one kind of use of this, I guess, is almost as like a a control in a larger uh, experiment, right? If you're going to do them more and more, right? And here we are. It's almost like a snapshot of this particular moment where we are, and we're in such an amazing moment, both in the world, you know, horrific and exciting at the same time, and in literature. You know, this is this is right. You know, a couple years post the We Need Diverse Books movement, which has radically changed the bookshelf um, in so many ways, and it'll be wild to see what this looks like. You know, a generation from now, for example, when kids didn't grow up with a mainly white bookshelf, like that's gonna it's yeah. gonna be a very different list, yeah. and that's exciting to see. So it's amazing that we have this in a lot of ways, and that we'll be able to see a change too as as we move forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I thought, gosh, well, that's really, that's a great thing. 
Yeah. That's a good point because so many of the books we all love are books we read when we were younger. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that makes it, yes. it makes a lot of sense that those are the ones that, oh, my favorite book is Pride and Prejudice. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Until you reread it and you're like, ah! <laughs> not Pride and Prejudice, <laughs> just in general. No, not Pride and Prejudice. Haven't re- I haven't read it once, so I can't reread ah! it. Oh. Leave me alone. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> read Ghost and then come complain. <laughs> Alright. He's the best. One minute. I think the book glosses over that, though. I don't think it, yeah. Isn't it the good guy that does it? I don't think. I so don't good think books let the readers decide and not, and not like, guide the reader too much and say, this is bad. Like, mm. they put it out there, and then readers are supposed to say, oh, we're supposed to recognize this as, but you don't think that that's her intent. No, because they're, they're deeply in love after that, right? right. I mean, she just, she work. submits, and, I mean, there's still, there's still tensions and stuff, but that never becomes an issue. I mean, for that, for me, that would be the end of it. So it was the end of it for me for the book. I stopped reading at that point. How many of these books did each of you read? How many, if you glanced at oh that Oh, my God. Our says our percentage. Well, our time's up. Uh, our time is up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't there goes the bell. Too bad. It's 100. percent Nice try. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good question. So guess. I don't know. Well, if our time is up, let's say thank you to Daniel and Jamie. You got it. And I did that time. And Joe, appreciate y'all's thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. That was a lot of fun. Support provided by Walters, Papillon, Thomas Cullens, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years.